Good afternoon, everybody, and you're all very welcome to CETA's regional virtual week taking place for the first time virtually. My name is Suzanne Purcell and I am General Manager of CETA. We are delighted to have so many participants who have registered for this week's event. I think we're well in excess of 80 participants and hopefully a lot of you will be able to be attending each of the days as we have some very interesting speakers and presentations lined up for the week. So first of all, I'd just like to thank the sponsors of CETA who without them, obviously these events would not be able to take place. We have Diatech, Digital Construction Technologies Group, Evercam, I3PT and SIS. So the regional week is on all week this week from half 12 until four. And we have people speaking from all the different eight counties that we have involved um, in the regional week. So just wanted for those who did notice we have a new, few new people who haven't attended CETA events before. And I'd like to welcome you all. You're very welcome to the first event for CETA if that's your first time coming. We have been in existence for over 20 years and we deliver events and training activities. Now, membership of CETA, if you're interested, is open to everybody. And there's a great diverse group of companies that are involved in CETA. We run monthly breakfast events. We have an annual conference. We run CETA Skillnet training courses. That's funded by Skillnet Ireland. And we are delighted to announce that the funding for 2021 has been secured for the training. So any training needs that you have, do get in touch with any of the CETA team and we'll be more than delighted to assist you. So for 2021, we are planning and putting things in place for this. Our theme, really our core focus that we're looking at the moment is business transformation and the circular economy. We are still planning and hosting the same number of events in 2021 as we held in 2020. We didn't drop any events even though we went virtual. So there is still plans for six digital transformation events, six tech trend events, 16 regional events, and the BIM Gathering Conference, which is planned for September 21. So at this moment in time, we hope that maybe in quarter three and quarter four, some of these events will be able to take place face to face. If not, we will just continue to run them virtually like we have done all throughout the year. So for today's event, I'm gonna pass you over to Gordon Chisholm. He's chairing today's event. He's a draw the short straw for Monday for the first day of it. We have some great speakers lined up and Gordon is going to bring you through the programme and just to announce the presenters as we go. So I hope you really enjoy the event and any of the further events this week, if you're in a position to attend, they will be recorded and we will be releasing them onto CETA's YouTube channel. So subscribe to that if you haven't already and enjoy the event. Thanks a million. Gordon, you might want to unmute yourself. There we go. How's that? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, welcome everybody um, into our, another virtual uh, webinar. But uh, let's hopefully we can um, make this uh, a good start to the week. Uh, we've got um, three speakers for you, uh, varied areas, uh, Mark Kennedy uh, from Ready Architecture and Urbanism, Archie O'Donnell, I3PT and Bill Hill of the Lighthouse Club. Okay, uh, I'll introduce people uh, a bit more just once I get to each of their talks. Uh, what we'll do as well is we'll have a Q&A at the end, so I'll maybe keep the questions until that point and um, we can get started. So just first off, I suppose I would normally just give you a wee update on what we're doing in, in Waterford. And we've only just finished this week our, look at this, uh, no clicking, no moving, there we go. We've only just finished this week our Triversity uh, workshop. This will be our seventh one now, and we went fully online. Now, the Triversity BIM Collaborative Workshop is set up to be an online, you know, using, um, digital construction information technology. So, you know, we were well uh, prepared for it in a way, 
but um, I suppose between all staff and, and, and students, we, we did lament not meeting up for the cultural context part of it. Uh, but anyway, it was uh, an incredible success for us. We had 130 students across three countries, um, uh, Sheffield Hallam uh, ran the project this year. And we had Kia, um, Copenhagen School of Art, uh, of Design and Technology, and ourselves in Waterford. So even even within our own cities, we were still dispersed. Uh, Kia did run some some of their students came into the studio, and the same in, in Hallam. But in Waterford, we were all fully dispersed. So the project this year was. Um, uh, a skills factory down in uh, Sheffield Hallam and just to the, the red arrow there is the site, to the right of that is the train station and just up uh, above it there about 10 o'clock is Sheffield Hallam University. So um, just uh, again, uh, with things that we did, we had a, a kickoff session on the 16th of October uh, for the prelude and um, the workshops that were runs from the 2nd to the 4th of November. So we wanted to get the students kind of uh, interested in, in, in get running and start collaborating because we had a number of platforms to get working on. So we were using all of this BIM 360 in terms of docs, design collaboration, model coordination, project management. We use Microsoft Teams as a communication tool and we introduced the students to LinkedIn to start disseminating what they were doing to the professional community. And uh, we had a great kickoff session from one of our graduates, Podrick Delaney, uh, who is now the, the London Regional BIM and Digital Construction Manager for Sherpa McAlpines, and he showed some really interesting projects. So this is the students, okay? And you know, when you're online, you've got to try and do something to, to engage. And um, so we asked them what to do a 30 second video, kind of, of where they are from, the locations, what their workspace is like, and um, these are all going to get put together. This is a sample. They're all going to get put together and uh, a video compiled. Uh, the teams uh, uh, operated on teams. So um, 12 teams. Uh, we covered architecture, structure, MEP, and QSN. And what worked really well was we had different channels in the team. So you know, this is going to digital teaching that we had the one teams project where different channels that were uh, private for each group but the staff could drop in and out when they wanted and what the students found really useful was just having that team channel on video all day long when they're working and they could just chat to each other drop in and out they even could go in and have separate little uh, video conferences if they were maybe talking about a particular element we would drop in talk to them we'd uh, look at the work they're doing do a bit of a uh, design review etc uh, all in all it was uh, really successful uh, also, they could collaborate on documents over Teams. Um, one aspect that worked really well was shared lectures. So between the three different cities and institutes, uh, lectures were performed and um, for everybody to share. And that is something that we're, we're considering taking forward now, uh, where there might be an expertise in Copenhagen or an expertise uh, in Sheffield or Waterford that can be shared um, within our classes. So. That's a really good outcome from this year. Okay, that's just the, the Kia workshop there where they had the big screen up there with everybody joining in. Okay, and just some of the bits on Teams there, that's image in the middle with a red on it. That was them discussing where to put the stair cores after one of our uh, crit sessions with the group. Uh, BIM 360 on the workflow. Uh, so we had them looking at uh, setting up in, in accordance with ISO 19650. Um, doing all the work through design collaboration and linking the models. So the models are pushed up, they were linked that way, uh, linking in out of respective folders from BIM 360. Uh, again, then assessing new work, remodeled, modified work within design collaboration, uh, and also model coordination. So, I mean, what was really great this year was we had um, a, a student group, Kia, took on the role of, of producing the MEP model. And having that there for them to to clash. Uh, predominantly it was BIM 360, but some of the students also looked at Navis works to use that. You know, so it's great outcomes, great learning for, for all involved in that. And then what, what worked really well then was um putting everything up on LinkedIn. You know, there was some great little bits of feed there, they were pushing out what they were doing, 
uh, and in a way we got more understanding of what they're going on by by looking at those little shots than maybe the final presentation sheets you know uh, it's great to see a little bit of script in there from dynamo uh, that was a class that was delivered uh, from Kia, who actually run a, a BIM cafe as well. And the uh, final presentations there, that was group seven there. Um, to be honest, there was a lot, a lot of work put into there that's maybe, you know, they haven't fully uh, displayed, but they do produce a PowerPoint as well when they have all this sort of background information within that. So look, that's just really quickly, just sort of the stuff we've been doing and working uh, try to uh, you know deal with being um, online, but in a way, this project and what we do in, in WIT and our, our architecture and technology program is you know we use the tools that are there. You know we're doing digital construction and um, it's you know relatively working well. Everybody misses um, not being together in the studios, but we can we can get by and uh, still at the same day produce quality projects like this over a couple of days um, over three countries. So I think there I shall end. Okay. And um, where's my screen sharing button? Everything's disappeared on me. Okay. Stop sharing. Okay. And um, I'm going to introduce you to Mark Kennedy. Okay, from uh, Ready Architecture and Urbanism. And Mark, with over 20 years experience as a director, leading the Kilkenny office responsible for projects across a range of sectors that include master planning, education, office residential and retail. As a qualified project manager, the Diploma in Architecture and Urbanism and RAI Conservation Grade 3 accreditation, Mark has a broad scope of experience and knowledge. Uh, Mark's going to talk to us about the Abbey Creative Quarter in his hometown of Kilkenny, with the delivery of the new brew house and Mayfair buildings. So, Mark, do you want to uh, share your screen? Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Gordon, and thanks for your presentation. They're very interesting. Um, we've been lucky to get some of Gordon's graduates to work with us here in Kilkenny, and I have to say the students coming out of WRT are excellent, which is great. Um, so now what I'll do is I'll just show you um, my presentation here. I'll move quickly. This is kind of a, a whistle-stop tour through the Abbey Quarter I must apologise also for the for my bio photograph. It's twenty years out of date, so I have aged since then. In case anyone was wondering, I was a fourteen year old coming to present today. So this is the Abbey Quarter Master Plan. Uh, a decision was made by Kilkenny County Council in two thousand and thirteen to buy the site from Diageo. The site had historically been a location for brewing for over three hundred years, and in a way, it being in single ownership for that length of time almost protected it from what happened in Ireland throughout various development phases, in particular the Celtic Tiger, where a large city centre site like that most likely would have become a, a big box retail unit. So the site we were given, we the first task we had to do was to look at the existing buildings on the site and to assess what was to be retained and what was to be demolished. And the first decision we made was that we would retain the brew house in the centre of the site and the Mayfair to the northeast of the site. Um, Kilkenny has very um, interesting characteristics as a city. It's very similar to Edinburgh insofar as that it has a main street with a with a castle on one end and a cathedral on the other. Edinburgh has a castle on one end and the palace on the other. And then in between that main street, you get what are known as herringbone streets, which uh, hit the main street in a per perpendicular fashion. So when we were looking at the master plan, it was the retaining of that unique characteristic of the streets and space of Kilkenny that were paramount to our design. So then I don't want to dwell too long on the master plan because I want to discuss the buildings and show how we use BIM for the evolution of the designs of those and how the efficiencies of BIM were really instructive and in how the buildings would be developed. So this is the overall master plan site here. Uh, the the uh, Parliament Street up into up into High Street, the castle runs up. There's a castle here, the cathedral here, and it's quite a large site, approximately nine hectares in the city centre with the brew house, brew house right at the centre and the Mayfair here. Brew House, very interesting building, um, built over a number of different phases. The original phase built in the 60s, but it actually went back to what's known as the Bauhaus style, which would have been a style of 1920s, 1930s architecture. 
So these are some of the 3Ds, uh, just a quick sketch of showing the size of this site relative to the overall city centre of Kilkenny, the castle here, St. Canis Cathedral, St. Mary's Cathedral, and then you can see this area here is the entire site, just some photographs of the city, I'm sure you're all familiar with Kilkenny, I hope you are anyway. So then looking at the master plan again and some of the CGI's as the, as the design evolved. Now one thing we were very aware of was that when you do a master plan for a city like this, you do not want to be over prescript, overly prescriptive in terms of the architectural style that you create. And in light of that, we, we tend to try to not show buildings uh, in our imagery for the master plan as it evolved. One thing that was really important to the local authority and also to our client was the deliverability of the master plan on a phase basis. So looking briefly at the phases for the master plan, it's the brew house and the Mayfair and the Riverside Park were all to be delivered in phase one. Riverside Park, so I suppose Kilkenny, what's interesting about Kilkenny is that um, the Duke of Ormond was the, was the seat of power was Kilkenny Castle. The Duke of Ormond was responsible for both Dublin and London turning to face the river and creating keys, but yet it never happened in his home city. So this project is the opportunity for Kilkenny to turn and face the, the river, which it, doesn't, which it doesn't do at the moment. So the Linear Park in here and the Brew House and Mayfair all on site at present. Phase two is the completion of the Brew House to create what's known as Brew House Square in the centre of it and potentially a hotel to the west of the site. Phase three then will be two urban blocks along by the river. And then the final phase will be the, the delivery of buildings to the north of the River Brega along the central access scheme into the site. So again, just some of the softer imagery that we've produced of the site. This is the brew house here, the Mayfair in this location. St. Francis Abbey as a centerpiece of this large public open space, Evans Terrace, and then the three blocks, three perimeter blocks um, with the narrow streets between them leading to this large public open space, the linear park along with the river. It's very easy to use. We try to keep them as soft as possible to allow for any type of architecture that might happen in the future on the site. So move on to the brew house, I have 10 minutes left. Um, so the brew house was the original, obviously, as the name says, brewery building in, in the, uh, on the campus, on the Abbey Quarter, and it was probably built in four phases, uh, each in varying styles and quality, a, a very robust concrete structure. And we felt it was very important, both in terms of archaeology and in, to in terms of the cultural heritage of the city, that this only example of a modernist industrial building in the medieval city would be retained intact. Another very interesting reason why you would keep a building like this is that underneath the eastern section, or the northern section of the building, is a significant amount of archaeology relating to the old um, friary. And um, the best way to preserve archaeology is to not touch it. It's a bit like Schrodinger's cat. Once you open the box, it's gone. So the, the idea here is that by keeping the brew house on the site where it was and refurbishing it, we're allowing for archaeology to be discovered in the future when methods and technology improve, as no doubt they will. So this is the view of the building as it'll look from the new public space that we're creating, Horace Barrett Lane, looking north towards the building. So this is this is this is I suppose um, when we first um, were looking at the site, there were a series of large buildings along by the river frontage. And as part of our process, we, we went through to look at the quality of each of these buildings and then determined that the Brew House and the Mayfair were the only ones to be retained, as, as uh, we mentioned earlier. These buildings in, in the background, this is the, the bottling store, uh, where they stored the, the bot all the, the beer bottles on the first floor. And this was the building where all the um, brewing vessels were housed. They were quite tall structures. That's two of them on the ground, which have been retained for use in the landscaping into the future. So the Mayfair is what we're, you can actually see at the moment there in red, so all the various bits and bobs of it. It evolved over time without any real thought as to how, what it might look like. So this is the top photograph here is the Bauhaus element of the building as it would have looked before the work started. Um, a very clear structural system to the building, a very fine glazing to it. And also in, inside here is a precast concrete stairs with the red spindles and um, or terrazzo lining on as well. Very interesting stairs which we've kept as part of the designs. And this is the view of the brew house as it was um, from, from the cathedral tower. What's very interesting with the building is that there was a large brick facade here visible from Parliament Street and that is where they always had signage in the building whether it said Smithix or Diageo but I think it's part of the history of the city in living memory and we felt it was really important that that blank wall be kept as part of the design development.
So then this here demonstrates how we were using BIM to successfully understand the building to work out how, how we would move forward in terms of demolitions and reconstruction ideas. Um, the building had a huge amount of different levels, different structural solutions, and as we arrived on site, uh, where columns were meant to be, they weren't, where walls were meant to be mass concrete, they were block work, where they were meant to be block work, they were mass concrete, so it was very complex, and really without the use of the point cloud survey, and then us building the full model, it would have been almost impossible to understand how this building um, was put together and how we could deconstruct and put it back together again efficiently. Now, when you look at these images at the, the, the post demolition survey, what the building looks like, you start to wonder why did we bother? Would it have been more less less, uh, but less expensive just to knock the whole thing and start again? One reason why you wouldn't do that is, is just the archaeology, and the second reason is that when we when we cost check this against the construction of a category A office building in Kilkenny, this comes in at approximately half the anticipated cost of a new build, which was very surprising to us. So it is quite efficient what we're doing here on the site. So then these are the plans of the, of the completed building. Um, the biggest design move we made, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to keep this iconic brick wall here, which will have some signage on it. And the, the single biggest design move was to press in part of the facade here to create an indentation, which made a very clear and obvious entrance location for the building. And as you move into the building, then we have a, an atrium space that runs up through the entire height. I was three that I'll show to you later. And then around this atrium, it's in, in a pinwheel, We've located offices, and as you can see here, there are 12 distinct uh, lettable office spaces in it. So the idea is that it will facilitate smaller business uh, innovation on the site, that smaller businesses can come and get possession of category gay, a office space, which otherwise is impossible to do. I don't think the, the standard of, of uh, accommodation being provided in this building is not available anywhere else in the city, and also this building will be a lead gold building, which again, which is the first of its type in the city. So this is the view of the reception area, and this is the view looking south, southeast towards the main entrance, and also that was the original structure in the background. Just some shots on our site as the works progress. You can see a very strong concrete structure. That this part of the building is called the Grist Building. So above this, there was vats containing yeast and bulk fermentation agents and that. So it was a really, really robust structure when we uncovered that that was to be retained and to be used as part of the office. Here on the roof, as you look back here, there was nothing on the top of the roof here. We put a very lightweight glass box on top of that. And this glass box sitting here now with the glazing just gone in on site and a very generous balcony that overlooks the new public park and direct view of St. Francis Abbey. This is in a view in the courtyard where we have a triple height glazing uh, facing into the atrium. As you can see the stairs for the atrium in the background there. Just some views. Uh, some of these are CGI. Some of these are recent images of, of, a, of the materiality and the type of fit out they were putting into the building. Again, office standard, office space stuff there. And then it's really a nice shot. So this is on the left here is the atrium as it was about last week with the with the structure of the stairs in place, the roof light overhead, the uh, board mark concrete wall here, and here's the CGI of what that space is to look like in the future. So it's coming along nicely there. So that's really it on the brew house for now. We'll probably be finished that project. Uh, obviously, there has been a delay on site due to COVID. Finish that project circa April, May 2021. And uh, very exciting time for the project. All the hard work is out of the way. All the archaeology, all the structural issues are, are behind us, we hope. And uh, so that's it for that. The next project then was the Mayfair. Uh, this project had a number of different iterations in design before we settled on its final use as the new home for Kilkenny County Library or said city it is actually the county library. Um, it started as an office building and we looked at other uses, you know, innovation unit, units like that, but none of them were really a good fit, but the building's an excellent fit for the county library. So again, this is where the building sits on the banks of the River Brega. Again, this would have been the for, along former Horse Park Lane uh, very intensive archaeology on the site and again the retention of the structure on the site is very important in terms of encapsulating the archaeology underneath and protecting it for future generations. Uh, this is what the building looked like and you can see some of the demolitions that happened here already. The substation for the, the substation for the brew house was located behind the Mayfair because the floor of the brew house when we went to dig it out um, was a meter thick concrete that they just couldn't get through so we gave up and relocated our substation. And this is the view of the um, the Mayfair from um, Irish Town 
in Kilkenny. Um, it's a very iconic double gable um, frontage with this small flat roof area. So what was really important to us that if, if this building is re retained and reused, that it's still identified with as the Mayfair and, you know, the kind of the typology of the building, the vernacular building that it is, would be retained in the designs that we create. So the Mayfair was, it was a, I was back in the, it opened out in 83, I don't think so, I think probably 53 or 63. Um, this was a, back in the day of the, of the, of the dance hall and, and the big bands, this was a major uh, location for all that carry on in Ireland. And uh, so it lives very strongly in, in the memory of the people in Kilkenny. I think a lot of people claim that there's a lot of uh, marriages came out of the ballroom. So it's a, it is an important place to people and they felt it was important that we retain it as a building and the integrity of it as a structure. As you can see there, this um, flat roof element and then the double pitched roof element in behind. So it was a really simple concept for the building. What we did was we extruded forward the the, the two gables to the front and created, whether there's a car park at the front of the one, created a public space to the front of the building, extruded to the rear to get more accommodation that we need for the library structure, and then filled in this element at the front here, and then put a louvre facade over all of this element of the building to try and tie it together, and also to bring some colour and life to it, to very clearly demark, whilst well, we keep this very simple form that this is indeed a public building. I think I'm I'm nearly out of time here, guys. So some other images of the of the building as it evolved, looking at our facade studies, ceramic, um, recycling covering the entire facade, and then some images of the centre of the building. This building is out to tender at the moment, or will be out to tender probably at the start of next year. Hopefully, it'll start in site next year and be completed um, you know, in around the middle of 2022. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was uh, excellent. That's uh, well, being a Kilkenny native myself, that was great to see uh, everything that has happened there. And looking forward to getting down uh, in and around the quarter when it opens up. Now, um, can you just stop sharing your screen, please, Mark? Thank you. And um, now I've got um, Archie O'Donnell lined up. Um, Archie um, is uh, the research and development manager at I3PT. And um, uh, Archie joined there in 2014 and leads research and development in the company, working, uh, he has developed company policy in relation to uh, BIM, sustainable, uh, sustainability, uh, NZEB and PAL-L. Uh, currently he's building a, an expert team to streamline regulatory compliance for modular projects focused on modern methods of construction and off-site manufacturing. Archie is ITTP's in-house specialist for part of modern regulations and thermal modeling and has presented extensively on the subject of CE marking implications for construction uh, regarding Brexit. So, uh, Archie. Uh, thanks, thanks, Gordon. Uh, a hard act to follow there. There's um, some really impressive stuff happening down in the uh, in this uh, southeast region. Um, and it's great to uh, to kind of keep in touch keep in touch with that. Um, what what I three PT are all about is uh, is is quality in design and construction, and being that third party body that can can evaluate that and take a view on that and and certify the building um, at the end of at uh, the end of uh, construction stage. But lately. We've been asked to become involved earlier in projects, just in project inception and in setting up the scope of a project, but also in the handover that buildings now seem to have a longer tail. There's more, um, uh, there's, there's more emphasis on the operation and on ma maintaining assets and, and keeping the value of assets uh, beyond um, handover stage. So what we've been researching here is you know what does integrated project delivery? What do, what what is that one single process or procedure that can deliver a project? And how does that uh, live from cradle to grave? And how does that bring in all of the project the project stakeholders? So um, as part of that, we started to look at well, what is the DNA of a project? What's that one? 
thread of, of information that, that that one thread that weaves its way through the project what's that golden um, thread really and and it's interesting to see how how you guys have done it in uh, in in the, the competition there that you can collaborate on a european wide basis across all of the the different sectors of construction and all of the different uh, disciplines and um, i also want to look at just the big issue at the moment is just how fragmented our industry can do so how can we all pull together as one as one industry as one to deliver um you know the the shared objectives of a project and and that's what's impressive to see in kilkenny how you know it's it's looking at a citywide view it's looking at how how you can have archaeologists and you know ecologists and lead consultants uh, bringing sustainability into the the heart of a project and delivering and delivering that along with conservation and these other aspects of a project that previously wouldn't have been fundamental but are now and then I want to talk about how information is the new the new DNA of the projects and and how you can bring that into the the core and the center of of a project so looking back in history i i am um, I used to share apartments with with uh, with architects when I was in college, and they always talked about this this sacred geometry that behind all buildings there was this simple rule that everyone understood. And I like the idea that you know, can you have one simple rule for for modern construction that everyone can can understand? And it seemed to be that 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 geometry within a building made everything work within a, the, the 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 building it worked structurally it worked for materials it worked for proportion it worked for acoustics and you know it, uh, the the quotation there is from the the the, uh, the middle ages and it's you know if when you take numbers out of things you know there there's nothing left uh, without computational everything is ra is wrapped in bl blind ignorance so it's saying well, what's the lessons from you know uh, the past that we can reuse, and uh, it's, um, and when we look at those buildings that have withstood the test of time and and are still iconic uh, at at this point, that you know we look at that there's there's a certain proportion behind buildings that that gives them an attractiveness and and resilience and robustness, and 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 also a beauty. So so this the 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 knowledge and the rules and the structures that lie behind construction they're actually quite simple but from that you can generate very complex forms very robust structures um, and 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 very intricate fractal fractal geometry but the fundamentally behind that there's incredibly simple tools so the guys that uh, the guys and, and girls that are working on the tools can use very simple methods to achieve the most complex um, constructions and achieve within that, um, you know, kind of harmonies and frequencies that, that go beyond merely, merely building. So, so we find in the past that, you know, the stonemasons could adapt and apply a few simple geometric rules and operations, simply scribing arcs to set out very complex um, geometries. And, pro and provide very sophisticated designs. So that link between the uh, the, the the architect and the site was 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 quite simple. There was an understanding there, a, a, a sacred language almost, and um, that could withstand you know generations. So that the, the life cycle of that was was almost in millennia that it took to build some of you know the, the hundreds of years that it took to build some of these these cathedrals. And coming, you know, the, the tracing floor in the cathedral, these proportions were brought down right into the tracery of the arches, that it was understood in all in all components. And you could see this geometry start to work its way through even the, the timber structures that you see in, in medieval buildings in mainland Europe. Those um, the describing of, of 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 arcs and squares and and you know, uh, hexagons is something that had a structural truth to it and and could make structures that were incredibly fine and incredibly fine, um, well engineered, uh, you know, using simple, simple rules. So um, 
when we look at this in modern times, we can see that that you know that that collaboration and communication can be delivered with BIM. This is a, a maintenance model for uh, Durham Cathedral, and you know you could say that those simple rules are carried through to the to the modern day. So what are the lessons for that? You know, we can we can see in architecture that you know the computation that we have at our uh, at our hands now allows us to build very elaborate structures. You know that 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 uh, hang lightly onto onto a building. Um, you know, even closer to home, we can see the the the, the, the simple geometries that 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 can enable you know, difficult structures to take place. And that's the collaboration there between engineering, architecture, site, uh, finite element analysis, um, it can, it can drive quite sophisticated end results. Um, and while we have all that on one side, and we know the power and we know the, just how, how impressive some of the, the results are that just looking at you know what's what's happening to Kenny and what the team are doing in Waterford, we can see that the 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 the, um, the potential is huge. But the reality is that that then has to apply itself to a very complex, fragmented industry. And we can't talk about a fragmented industry. We can't talk about the complexities of building without thinking about the the um, the tragedy that occurred. Um, three years ago and and looking at the fundamentals of that and then you know it is um, a very honorable well designed um, uh, energy efficient project had you know fundamental problems when it came to execution and one of the issues is that you had a large number of components uh, parts to that and with 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 any type of complex system, the interrelationships between all of those components is what makes the whole function uh, in terms of its performance requirements. And while looking at the performance requirements in terms of energy, some of the performance requirements in terms of um, uh, fire performance was 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 neglected. So a good term of detail uh, didn't work in terms of the the materials that were chosen at the key interface between the the, the cladding and the and, and the window, uh, quite down to the choice of insulation, but also the the coordination of the different component parts of that building and their different performance requirements. And you know, uh, key key components uh, that should have been checked that should have been should have been coordinated, uh, didn't happen. So the cavity barriers uh, should have been coordinated across the entire building using three different component parts of that. In reality, some of those were left out uh, around the windows and also around the crown. And that was catastrophic to the, to the, to the building, uh, which resulted where um, a fire that should have been contained in one compartment uh, resulted in 72 lives, lives lost. So, so those materials um, needed to be coordinated by a number of parties. And fire engineering, mapping out the regulatory system of fire is complex. So how do you bring that down to your, your project? Um, is, it, is it the building regs? Is it done through the building regs? And the building regs are the starting point and everything revolves around that. But who is, who is ultimately responsible? And the myriad of consultants, specialists, contractors, subcontractors divides that clear and consolidated points of responsibility. So what's the solution? Is, can BIM be the solution? We would say that BIM is all about information. It's all about people. It's all about communication and message. And that's where the, the solution lies. That's what, what BIM has to do going forward. If we look at this, Design stage, we'll see that when you look at the facade, it was made up of a whole range of components. And who was designing that? In reality, the design team were responsible. As a design and build pretender, it was down to the design team to specify and design the performance requirements of that. When it went to construction stage, that all got, uh, got quite blurred. 
and uh, the, some of the design consultants were um, novated uh, across to the design team, but others weren't. Exova never made it across. A lot of the design then got seeded across to the construction stage. And it was never clear exactly who had uh, specification responsibility, who had design responsibility, who had coordination responsibility, where all that was, was mapped. And it, 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 it wasn't mapped. So one of the outcomes of, of the um, inquiry was this need for a golden thread, a digital golden thread. But what would that do? How, would you, how do you manage the relationships that occur along that, that thread? So you need, you need team integration so that there are methods in place for a better working atmosphere. So that not only are the tools there, but the culture is there where knowledge is exchanged this joint working, so much like the collaboration we saw on the, the projects there, that, that there's a focus on managing uh, tasks collectively and, and in real time. Uh, risk is allocated uh, in terms of the um, competence of various parties at each stage of the project and the detail gets elaborated as the project uh, evolves and that responsibilities, particularly um, overlapping responsibilities are mapped, and that you know pro problem solving becomes the main the main goal of the project, and the enabler of that is is BIM. So we see those those issues, those those um, uh, those those constraints are built in right from the start. So the regulatory system uh, had issues. Industry behaviour was a race to the bottom. The guidance was confusing and was siloed. So each discipline thought they just had to look after what was, what was allocated to themselves. And design and change management wasn't well, well documented. Even the testing uh, and the market, the testing labs and the, the, the supply chain uh, had issues. So these are all lessons that we have to bring into our, our everyday life. And we should be clear about who, what where responsibilities lie, who are the duty holders, um, and what happens then after occupancy. So there's a, they're, they're the main drivers to, to digital construction. Um, the communication of, of, of project requirements, accountability, and being able to track decision-making and reporting. So with the move towards design for manufacture and assembly, the, 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 need, the need for uh, modular and offsite to offset the skills gap, the, um, the need for better collaboration tools because of you know, the world that COVID has created with, with more distance and, and remoteness. Um, you know, we need to have community, it needs to be about communication tools, it needs to be interactive for efficiency. It should be embedded in all of our processes and be measurable. Quality should be measurable across all activities. Um, it should be impartial and neutral, and the tools should track the status and report to the decision makers. But it has to be simple so that those people on the tools, the stonemasons, the, the carpenters, they need to understand what's important to them and not, not a dump of information, just what's pertinent and, and simple. Um, and it should be easy to diagnose uh, where you are in the project and easy as well to digitize all of those processes. Just today, we were looking at a system to digitize technical submittals of products that are going to be under scrutiny for Brexit. Uh, the, the no deal is going to mean that, you know, if you have a product coming from the UK, you need to know that that's um, accredited by a third party outside the EU. So, so you know, so that information needs to be structured um, to, to form that auditable train trail uh, and, and allow for um, decision making and, and accepting. So, so we've devised our own approach to Cert Central. It would mirror man, many other common data environment and quality systems, uh, but it's, it's based on simplicity. It's about collaboration, exchange, classification, you know, using those, those mapping systems and, and diagnosis analysis that you, you can get a real-time analysis of where you are on the project against where, where you should be. And that's not just against BCAR and quality control. Uh, certainly our 
our genesis was in uh, quality management and and vcar but now we're trying to extend that so so right through to the the operation stage and that's where we look at you know st use the language of uniclass to be able to um communicate across different different silos and supply chains but also then plug in the the tools for the quantity surveyors are using you know NDS, ARM, ICMS at, at the start of the project and at the end of the project then bring in uh, SFG20 for maintenance and build, you know, start, start to continuously improve our search central tools so that our mobile tools uh, build in, um, we're currently connecting um, maintenance tools, point cloud survey tools, um, uh, cost management tools and, and to bring them all in through through integration APIs into our current platform. Um, and, and, and Search Central, its goal is to, you know, to automate workflows, make it more efficient for people to, to collaborate and, and produce simple information that builds together to give a really good 360 degree view of a project. And we have that as a, as a tool for Beaker, but also as a tool that we license out to, to companies and contractors. Um, we're using it on passive house projects in Edinburgh. We're using it on um, refineries uh, in, in, the, in the Middle East. We're also using it on um, you know, large profile projects in, in, in Dublin and um, uh, throughout Ireland. And, you know, it's basically about having a whole suite of tools that can be as sophisticated as you need as a, as a project manager or as a, as a designer, um, a contracts manager, but as simple as you need if you're just, you know, um, a fund manager or a client, if you're a health and safety manager, or if you're um, a subcontractor or foreman. And we do this using um, digital tools, just simple pin drop on, a, on, a, on an app, uh, having a dashboard that gives real-time analytics and just being able to track documents quality. So as it gets towards the end of a project, everybody knows exactly what they, what they have to do. Uh, we have a common data environment for, for BIM, a file manager and BIM viewers, and we're currently moving our, our tools to be able to be interactive and immersive with, to be able to drop uh, pins and issues and navigate through a, a, a building control view of a, a building model. Um, so it's, it's all about communication, keeping it simple and going back to that idea that you have that one singular rule that everyone on the project understands. And it's just that, that everyone on their iPad can just simply call up a floor plan, drop an issue, they can, they can check their timeline to see what tasks they have. And it's, it's simplicity, but that builds to be a very complex system. So, um, the, uh, yeah, so, so thanks for the opportunity to present that. And if there's any questions, I will take them at the end. Thanks. Gordon, are you there? Gordon, yeah. Do you need to amuse yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry I'm late to the meeting. Hi, Alan. How are you? Thanks very much, Archie. That was very insightful. Um, there we so, go. Hi, Gordon. Hello. How are you? Sorry, I'm only getting on online now. I missed your 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 talk earlier. But, right, uh, okay. I'll give you a private preview later on if you want. <laughs> You know, don't you? You won't miss nothing. So, how are you all down in Watford? Good, good. Are you online? And we're all online. We're all doing away. Yeah, a yeah. bit online, a bit of studio work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, it's great to. Uh, sorry, coming in late. It's great to see this uh, regions week. I know the guys are doing a great job in getting a, a whole program there. And um, as I say, I'm only sorry I missed the earlier presentations, but. Um, so Archie, are you finding now very quickly? Are you finding um, in this at this time of COVID nineteen that there's been a real there's been a repurposing or or a refocus around digital, and this is now really really important. 
for your clients? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first lockdown gave people an opportunity to take stock of, um, of where they were going, of their goals and objectives. And sustainability, along with digital delivery, became, became huge. I think uh, there was a, a reluctance or a reticence among people to use remote meetings. And now they find that, you know, it's bef before lunchtime, you've had three Zoom meetings and two team meetings. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the same with, um, with project delivery that I think there's a, there's a change there that, that you know, particularly people are finding that there is a reduction in productivity and it's somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. And some companies are realizing that they can recoup quite a bit of that just through, uh, through digital tools. And there's also, I think, um, a need to reduce waste inefficiencies um, just the costs of of um, abortion yeah. and and delays and dis you know and even even disputes like nobody wants to wants to get into arbitration and things like that so 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 digital is 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 seen as you know if 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 you're fighting to struggling to find a way of actually making a project work um, digital could be you know, the difference between success and failure. Yeah, and actually, uh, I, my last comment in that is you mentioned the Hackett Review, and actually, uh, there was quite a lot of reference to Hackett indirectly at the CETA Digital Transformation event last week. I know PJ Rudden made reference to this golden thread, uh, this golden thread of BIM data, and actually, um, you know, it, I suppose what, what the Hackett Review has done uh, is is throwing a spotlight on the need for building owners and their contractors to understand what products and materials are actually in the building, you know, um, as it's being built, um, so that they can, you know, monitor, you know, its 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 appropriateness and its uh, and so on and so forth. So it's it's interesting that um, it's it's now becoming a, a very important. Um, important component of the building design and delivery, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it used to be that uh, the digital was just for the designers or the contractors had their own version of the model mm. um, that they would use just to identify where the, the, the anomalies and the, the, the cost differences were between design and, and delivery. Uh, but, but, you know, currently the, the the emphasis has moved away from away from that, and it's actually the the funders of the project. It's the end users that are, are asking for that information. And yes. It's it's the the the, um, the the clients that are asking for that aren't the ones that we would expect it to come from. Um, and you know, so so. Uh, uh, particularly in the in the UK, they seem to acknowledge that you know it's it's that Im immutable record um, that 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 pr that having um, a good digital record of the the story of a building is important, as well as having a very accurate model of what was actually built, so that there's a huge value um, in an asset in 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 knowing what what its costs will be in terms of maintenance, and you know we're seeing a lot with PRS with with housing and with um, with other projects that you know it's no longer speculative build it sell it get out of town it's it's build it operate it for fifteen years package it up and and hand it over um, so so the value after fifteen years of that asset. Is the value of the maintainable assets and and the the uh, durability of that building? You know the the um, yeah the life cycle uh, value of that building. So at the end of fifteen years, you want to be able to say that you know point uh, click on um, a certain component. You know that could be the the extract fans and say look these were replaced after the, the, the filters and the the fan motors were replaced after year 10 mm -hmm. and every single year it's had a service so so that's kind of the value that the bricks and mortar the the physical um 
asset, the land value, can actually can actually be um, only one part of it, and, and quite a considerable value is the the operational costs, the maintenance cost, and the the the, the eventual handover cost. So there's a different a, 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 a different paradigm associated with with, um, with with some building assets and and. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, particularly assets that are developed on, on a campus or for a for a blue chip company, they're 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 looking at that and looking at that digitally, and that's why we're starting to see that the the communication between the different um, sectors and silos that there's a, there's people looking at like John Egan, like like Matterlab, they're looking at you know so how do you get that interoperability between different different functions and silos. And and that's the that's where where the, the most important work I see it that this, the the CETA group and that the EAC high are mm -hmm. doing is mm -hmm. is looking at how do you knit this all together. Yeah, it's keeping that project information model updated constantly through the life cycle. Uh, that sorry, was, Alan. Okay, that that's my bit done. Sorry. Is yeah. it? Oh, thanks. No, I just we're we're, we're just absolutely. You have Bill next, yeah. Yeah, we've got Bill up next, and we'll do some more uh, Q and A's just at Thank the you. end here. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. so. Bill, are you ready there? I'm ready. Yeah, so we've got um, Bill Hill, who's the CEO of Lighthouse Club. Um, Bill, um, it's a construction industry charity. Bill, ga Bill gained over 20 years' experience holding senior positions in blue chip giant Hewlett Packard and Sage PLC. He has a passion for customer service, has a wealth of experience across the major business disciplines of marketing, sales, operations, and finance. He joined the Lions Construction Industry Chart in 2013 and since then has played a major role in significantly growing the profile and significance of its charitable work within the construction community. The charity now operates a 24-7 industry helpline. It has also developed a construction-focused health and well-being app and plays a central role in building mental health, the construction industry's key mental health awareness and support program. So, Bill... Um, very interesting to see what you, you're going there, your topics, the road to well-being. And um, if you want to share your screen, take it over. I uh, will do. Thanks very much for that uh, glowing introduction. I wonder who wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, uh, let me share my screen with you now. Obviously, I read it then, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Must have been me. Okay, let's go with a slideshow. Okay, that, that's me when I go out to dinner. Um, okay, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to speak to this uh, this group. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great privilege and pleasure to, to bring this subject, which is probably completely different from all the other subject matter that uh, you've been listening to so far, uh, but it's equally, equally important, I think. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the road to well-being and you know, basically, you can't see a headline anywhere at the moment without somebody mentioning uh, mental health and well-being. Um, so, what I'd like to go and say is talk about is what is the mental health and well-being within inside the construction sector, and uh, what we're trying to do about it to improve it. So, so let's start with the why. What, why should we be interested um, in the mental health of our workforce? Uh, within construction that goes across all the disciplines from you know all the architects down to the hard boots on the ground uh, etc the mental well-being of our sector is vitally important um, not only just if I think everybody would agree that if if you've got a healthy mind you've probably got a safe site and uh, listening to to Archie's comments as well of how fragmented the businesses are uh, then it's vitally important that you've got people that are pretty switched on um, but unfortunately, we are not in a wonderful position. Um, there's uh, been a lot of research on this subject, and I think everybody knows that uh, construction could be a hugely rewarding um, industry to be in, but it also has its risks as well. Um, I won't go through all these stats, but the two that uh, I will uh, emphasize is stress, depression, and anxiety accounts for a fifth of all work-related illness. And that's the illness that is actually reported. We believe it might be higher than that because not everybody reports the reason why they're off work is because of stress, depression or anxiety. But the statistic that really knocked the industry for six uh, and said, we have got to do something 
is when we did all the analysis and found that every single working day in the UK, we lose two construction workers to suicide, um, which is the number one industry for suicide. It's a nobody, absolute nobody wants to be the number one industry for suicides. In fact, it's only today that the Office of National Statistics have come out with uh, their latest results and male suicides are now at a 20 year high. And if you consider that 87% of the population within construction is male, then we're going in one direction at the moment. The second element is a little bit of information about Ireland um, as well, talking to the, cons um, the Construction Industry Federation and the work that they've been doing in this subject matter. 50% of all male suicides in Ireland are from construction. Uh, again, these are statistics that seem to go under the radar, but we need to absolutely do, do, do something about them. And I think if we do some analysis, then you can see why the stresses and strains of being in construction have got their own unique um, issues. Um, you've got long working hours. Well, a lot of uh, industries have long working hours. You're, you're sometimes away from home for considerable periods of time on projects. You're often staying in not wonderful accommodation. Um, it's very difficult to keep up relationships when you're away from home for periods of time. There's a massive, and I think Archie mentioned this as well, is about the massive amount of subcontracting that goes on in our industry. And something like 53%, and maybe even higher in Ireland, is of our workforce are self-employed subcontractors or on zero-hour contracts and working for sometimes very, very small companies. So there's a huge amount of job uncertainty to know where the next job uh, is coming from. Um, unfortunately, being away from home, then there are certain propensities towards self-medication um, in alcohol and also in, in drugs as well. So you can see here that this is not a really healthy picture um, as we look forward. And the other thing as well is that, you know, the industry's done a tremendous job. I mean, uh, going back to when the charity started in 1956, there was over 200 instances of fatalities on sites around the UK and Ireland, which was huge. Um, that is now down to somewhere between 30 and 40, maybe 45 um, across modern average, which is 45 too many, but it's a vast improvement. And I think everybody has done a massive job uh, in looking after and trying to drive safety as a priority. But I would say to you is that for many years, we've been absolutely shouting safety, but we've only been whispering health. Um, the health side of health and safety has not been uh, at such a, a major part of what we've been concentrating on. So in, uh, in 2017, uh, the government in the UK uh, asked two, two people, Lord Stevenson and Paul Farmer, who's the CEO of Mind, uh, to put together um, something that tells us what is the state of the mental health of the industry uh, going forward. And also there was the construction sector deal, which was on the July um, in 2018, which talked about mental health as a major component of it trying to improve that uh, within the industry. Um, but going back to the Thriving at Work report, which is it's downloadable, it's a very readable report, so, and, and it, it's very generic, so it's very easy to, to get a good grasp of, of what's been applied there. But, but what they came up with six core standards, and again, i am not got the time to read all these out, but these slides will be sent to you. Um, to, so you can read them at, at your leisure. But there were six core standards that said, these are very simple, basic things that a company can do to improve um, their workforce well-being um, and take it forward. And they also came through with four enhanced standards to say, okay, once you've achieved those other standards, here's some ways of making these even better um, to try and improve uh, the, the well-being. And it's all on this road to well-being uh, which is a major, and I think somebody mentioned it earlier in one of the presentations, a cultural shift uh, within the industry uh, towards seeing this as being a, a hugely important factor. And we did some research on how many people had applied uh, these um, uh, standards, and um, it's, it's okay, and it's moved, uh, which, is, which is good. It's moved in the right general direction. 52% of the organisations that uh, we surveyed 
had achieved the, the six core compliance elements um, and 28% had gone further and achieved uh, applying uh, compliance against both uh, in, uh, standards, both the standard and enhanced. So a long way to go, but definitely uh, an improvement on, on, where, on where we've been. So as a charity, we've been working with the industry and saying, look, what can we do as a charity? What can we do? We're right in the middle of this. We are a charity that is totally dedicated to the health and well-being of the construction sector as a whole. And uh, we've been group working with a group called uh, Building uh, Mental Health. And uh, we've got over 500 companies now signed up to a charter that says, uh, and it's, the charter is somebody in senior management saying, we believe that mental well-being of our workforce is a priority and we are going to do something about it. And basically, that's all the charter says. And they go onto the website, download the charter, sign up to it, send it back to us, and we put them on the website saying, you've signed it, well done. Now, if that's all the company did, then um, it wouldn't go much further than that. Having senior management say they're going to do something is one thing. Having them then to do it is, is also another thing. But I'm delighted to see that many companies are moving along this road to well-being. And the second stage of this is that we believe that every single person in the workforce, whether they are a staff member, a subcontractor, um, an agency worker, whoever is on your site should have access to an employee assistance program. Um, and, and some of the bigger companies have now extended their private employee assistance programs to say that this will now include our subcontractors. However, that is not practical for every company. So this is where our charity has stepped in and we provide a free employee assistance program and a free supporting app. But again, it's, it's a bit pointless having these great tools in place if you don't get the individuals to talk about the problems. And, and for a long time, mental health has been a taboo subject. Uh, there's, it's very difficult within the male psyche, especially, uh, to open up about how you feel about certain things to your fellow worker uh, in the workplace. So we developed a toolbox talk, which again is downloadable free of charge from this, this site. Um, it's, a very, it's all scripted and any people person can deliver it to their workforce. But what it does is gets people talking in, in, a, in a closed environment, in a trusted environment, about some of the things that they may have never talked about before. And I can assure you, having done many hundreds of these toolbox talks, that when you get people in the room to start talking about things uh, away from uh, Radio 5 and sport and rugby and football and get them talking about real feelings, it's sometimes difficult getting them to stop. The next step does involve a little bit of money, uh, which is, It'd be really good if you got all your people managers tuned in and, 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 and educated on being able to recognize when somebody is struggling and how to approach somebody who's struggling uh, to help them to get signposts, to get extra help. And the fifth step in this very simple process is, is a good idea to have somebody who's accredited as, as a site well-being, a site well-being champion, maybe accredited to... Um, uh, to mental health first aid standard, which is a two-day course, um, or I Am Here is one that we're working with as well. And big companies like CISC have taken on I Am Here, and uh, they're pushing that out to well-being champions dotted around their sites, uh, which, is a, which is a good thing. So, so what, what's our, how is our charity involved in all this? Um, well, basically, we deliver three core elements of that five-step plan. Um, First of all, we deliver a, a 24 by 7 helpline. It's absolutely free to any uh, entity in the construction workforce in the UK or Ireland. They can phone it now if they're in a crisis and there'll be somebody on that phone that will help them. Full stop. The second area is, and this is maybe tied into this group a little bit, we did put technology at the centre of this as well because we recognise that uh, people do a lot of self-learning and to do that they can use uh, an app so we've we created an app that's got um, a very easy to navigate uh, around the major subject areas of of health and well-being um, and we we've got uh, the areas of mental well-being the areas of physical well-being 
and financial well-being, which, if you think about it, makes up your overall well-being. And many of the cases that come through to our helpline initially manifest themselves as a financial well-being issue, but underlying nearly every financial well-being issue, there is a mental health problem behind it because somebody is really anxious about their family, about putting bread on the table, getting them fed, where the next uh, uh, meal is coming from. And the other area that uh, we've recently developed is free training. We are offering free mental health and resilience training to, again, to anybody within the construction workforce. Um, it's out there. And the, the mental health and, and, and wellbeing training uh, looks at key areas like coping with stress, work-life balance, mindfulness, resilience, meditation, which is, again, goes down interestingly well with construction workers. Uh, believe it or not, it really is, it, does, it, does, it has taken on well. We've got another one called Bang On Budget, which is all about how to do financing, what's good debt, what's bad debt, because a lot of our cases get themselves into serious debt problems. And one that is very relevant at the moment, which is a CV workshop and at the interview, because with, uh, with uh, the issues within our industry and through the pandemic that's here at the moment, then there's a lot of people that are, are in jeopardy of losing their jobs and, and many people have actually done so. so. So you can see the picture that we are trying to paint here. And our mission as a charity is that no construction worker or their family should be alone in the crisis. That is what we are driving for. And you can see here what we're trying to do. You've got a 24 by 7 helpline that anybody can phone at any time. You've got a self-help app that sits there and it's got interesting uh, things about coping strategies, um, where you can get help. And we've researched um, over 3,000 areas to get help. And it's got a geolocator inside the app. So if, uh, if somebody is got looking at anxiety and there's some organization close to them that is quite good at delivering anxiety, it'll be in the app. And uh, we're adding to that all the time, the libraries to that all the time. So we can geolocate and get somebody close to hand, not just the big national charities. Then if you look at education, it's about then building the proactivity um, as well. So people getting better at managing their own resilience, managing their own stress levels, managing their work-life balance as well to stop the phone call happening in the first place. And the final big piece is trying to get people on site. Somebody on site is a go-to person who, who you can trust, who you can give your confidence to, who's got skills that can listen to your problem and, and be able to take it um, on, on board. So, so my message to, to this group is, you know, what can you guys do to help? Um, and if you're in a position of decision-maker authority for your organisation or you're meeting with a lot of other construction companies, which you are um, in this, this group, is spread the word. Please spread the word that we are here for them, both in the UK and in Ireland. We're here for them 24-7. And, and by spreading the word also, then please get hold of these little helpline cards um, and the posters. Get them on the site so that they can see. So get hold of the helpline packs. And if possible, um, then make a contribution to the charity in some way, shape or form. You know, ideally, that would be great if it was a, an annual pledge to, to make some donation to the charity, which would be absolutely ideal. Uh, the second area which you can help is, and this is geared towards fun, so we're not all about gloom and doom. Um, it's about a bit of fun as well. Uh, we've created, and again, using a bit of technology, uh, we've created an e-Christmas card, um, and you can buy the e-Christmas cards from us, and then you can ship them out to your employees, contractors, suppliers, and inside each of those e-Christmas uh, um, cards, there's a, is a Christmas cracker um, draw, uh, to, to, to register for a Christmas cracker. And the individual who registers will get back a unique number. And we're going to have a great big Christmas party um, on the 18th of December, a big virtual party. We're trying to get thousands to come to it where we've got lots of entertainment and we'll do the Christmas cracker draw and somebody out there will win 10,000 euros stroke £10,000 if they're in the UK. Um, so, so it'll be great fun and we'll have a lot of, uh, a bit of a laugh and hopefully bring a lot of cheer uh, at Christmas time. And, and finally, um, I think uh, as Archie was talking about the golden thread, I talk about the golden nuggets because if you, if you can't support us in any way, then uh, basically my message is please follow these three simple golden nuggets um, and the world will be a better place. 
The first one is from the Samaritans and it's don't ask once, ask twice. So if you're walking by somebody, um, ask them um, if they're all right. But don't ask them once, ask them uh, twice. And, and in Gordon's words, you don't just go, are you all right? You go, you all right, pal? I think that's how it's said. And, and so it's mildly aggressive, but it's well intended. Um, but ask twice. And the second one is from a guy called Dr. Stephen Covey. Um, and basically it's seek to understand before you seek to be understood. We're all very quick to throw solutions at somebody and quickly get into the problem and even identify it with a problem that you've had. Um, it's far more important you sit back and let that person tell you what is going wrong with them because a problem to them is real. It's not necessarily when you look at it through your lens that you see it as a problem, but it's a real problem to them. So make sure you take the time out to seek to understand before you seek to be understood. And my final thing is from the Dalai Lama, um, always be kind. There is absolutely no reason to be unkind to another fellow human being. So even if you've got a difficult message to give, if you can deliver it in a humane way to protect their dignity and support them as much as you can through that problem, um, that is very beneficial. So if nothing else, if you can't donate and you can't get your e-cards, then please just follow these three golden nuggets and let's change the culture with insight construction and make sure that every worker has got a place to go in a crisis. Did I manage to catch up some time? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> You did very well there, Bill. I'm not sure about the uh, the um, taking off the accent now, but well, you see, I'm more cultured than you, Gordon. Oh, thanks very yeah. much. Yeah, that was a pretty good impression, Gordon. To be fair. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, well, I've got to say, yeah, I'm impressed. I'm well. We'll take it. We'll leave it be there anyway. I'm just okay. be kind is ringing in my head there. <laughs> <laughs> But look, ben, that was um, that was very interesting. Unfortunately, um, it's statistics that um, are sobering. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'd say we, we we could all identify some, if not all, of the risk factors that you you, you lined up there, um, which is crazy that you know we're really all aware of what issues are, and um, you know how to how to deal with that. You know, like taking that forward there, you know, is it, are you looking at better contracting and conditions for, for the construction industry workers? Um, is that where you see help working? Well, I, I basically see like we, we're there to catch them as a safety net. They, again, the industry, and, and I see the industry moving quite a lot. I mean, I visit a lot of sites and I've seen over the, over the years the welfare um, elements they put into the larger sites are quite significant now and uh, you know they offer you know individuals coming to that site a, a reasonable place um, for their own well-being but but then when you sometimes get onto the smaller sites the, the 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 resources are not there for that but but what can be done is if if, if in the public areas if, if at least you can put up a poster to say look if you're having a problem and you're in construction then phone this number somebody will be listening to you because the smaller companies don't have HR departments. They don't have um, the infrastructure to be able to deliver that. Um, but the small companies can invest in this program and actually give people the, the little helpline cards that we've got, you know, the you know, little helpline cards like this. And on one side, it's got the UK numbers and on the other side, it's got the Irish numbers. And it's also got, you know, you would see this, but it's got some key numbers to call as well, like the Samaritans or 111 in the UK. And in Ireland, it's got um, the similar, the Samaritans and things like uh, MABs and, uh, and bereaved IE and all this sort of type thing. So it's, it's got key numbers on here. And we've got 600,000 of these little cards in circulation now. So we're making good inroads and getting the number out there to people, but we've got a long way to go. You know, there's still, that's only maybe 25% of the population of, uh, of working in construction. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm thinking down, down where we are. Anyway, it's, it's a lot of um, one and two person companies that are, that are out and about. And um, I, when I've seen your, your stats coming up there, and when it's always, you know, when I'd be talking to subcontractors, it's, it's that whole side of being paid. Uh, and I think the UK have got a different system to Ireland on that. But um, 
I, I was surprised that wasn't higher on your um, on your chart. Yeah, I think I think Ireland is this one. I mean, I think in the UK the statistic is something like three hundred and fifty thousand companies work in construction, but ninety percent have got less than ten people in them. And I think that might be, you know, obviously the numbers are not as big as that, but the statistic of less than ten people is probably higher. Okay. Okay. Well, look, I'm just going to throw questions open to the floor for um, Archie, Mark, and Bill. If anybody wants to type one in or pop their mic on and throw in a question. Yeah, yeah, I, I too was uh, shocked by the stats. Like 50% of suicides are in construction. Um, that's shocking, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we're, we're working very strongly with the CIF as well. In putting, I, heard, I see that, yeah. yeah to, to try and get yeah. a message out there. But it's just something, as again... And again, having done that, you know, the, the work behind suicide prevention, et cetera, it's just catching people in the moment and stopping them having that suicidal thought. I and mean, if you catch people in the moment, it's a massive turnaround. And can um, that be broken down further, Bill? I mean, can that be broken down further into, like, male, obviously, and what the nature of the work they're doing? Is it blue-collar workers, really, mainly, is it? It's, it very much peaks around uh, middle-aged, low-paid um, which is the, the highest peak um, in there. And unfortunately, we're beginning to see um, a, a, a peak arriving at the younger generation as well, um, which is a, a lot smaller in numbers, but they're, they're growing more significantly at the lower end, age range up to 25 as well, you know, where they seem to be kind of lost. And the statistic, the male and female statistic is, her, is horrendous. Out of so 6,000 suicides every year, then about 5,000 of them are male. Um, that says a lot. You know, how come? And one of the biggest factors in that is we don't talk and we don't put people around the network, you know. We're not, we're not doing the talking. We're, we're just bottling things up and then we think the only way out is, um, is, is to get out. Mm. Mm. And... Um... Okay, so I mean, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So how do you get your message across, say, the UK and Ireland? How do you, is it like this? How do you get your message? I know you touched on it. Yeah, the only way we can get a message out is for you know, groups like this to take it on board, look at where they're going, where they're working, um, you know, get hold of these cards. I mean, all, all we can do is be the safety net at the moment. It's very difficult to get us to get in front of the curve. The only way we're going to get in front of the curve is for companies to take on the education programs so that we're, we're actually building up front at the induction side of things that, you know, when people come on site or come on to site or through their apprenticeship programs is that we're giving them the, the ability to say, look, you know, don't, don't struggle here. You know, there's places you can go to get help and support. So don't, don't get in so deep that you can't get out. Uh, and that's been far more proactive than just to say when somebody is in the crisis, you know, phone this number. Um, and the app will help as well because a lot of the the next generation will, of the newer generation, younger generation, will use the technology uh, to get to the source of the problem as well. So, you know, adoption of the app is going to be helpful too. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm, yeah. I, I know that IBEC have a well, a keep well mark. Have you seen that? They have a kind of a, a brand uh, called the keep well mark. It's an IBEC initiative and that, you know, you have to go through various protocols, but once you get that, um, it's, a, it's an accreditation, it's a well-being workplace accreditation, um, but that'd be more kind of, I suppose, cross-business, but this is a particular challenge, isn't it? Construction, opportunities, construction, trades, um, that really was the, that's really where the problem is, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, mainly our charity is 100% dedicated to construction, so we're only looking at the construction problem. But, you know, in, in Ireland, in the past, it has been agriculture has been a big problem. Um, we, we are now, I'd say, you know, looking at maybe the modernisation in agriculture, you don't get the same numbers mm -hmm. as you do in construction now. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I, I think we'd like to look at this further. I know the construction IT would like to look at this further going forward, particularly into 21, when, like, you know, everyone needs a bit of well-being and, well, and, and mindfulness to, to get through. Next year is going to be difficult, no? For everyone. Um, so, 
Um, I think we'd like to keep that conversation going if we could, Gordon. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, I was just thinking there that, you know, as you were going through it there, that, you know, I've not seen your cards down at the college, but I wouldn't have been up in the trade section. So I don't know um, if they've been sent out to the colleges and the ETBs that are running training programs. But that may be a, a, a good place to, to be getting in touch with apprentices. Absolutely. If, if you could contacts there, you know, absolutely. We'll, we will make the contact with them and, and get them loaded up with cards and posters and get them out to the public places. And the more that happens, I mean, if people don't know to contact us, we can't help them. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll have a, I'll have a, a word with, with our guys down there who run the apprentices uh, section. Because uh, that does make a bit of sense there to be getting in at that level anyway. Absolutely. You know? You know, because certainly all the colleges would have uh, their own in-house uh, elements for uh, helping the students. But in a way, the apprentices are, aren't on campus or online on campus the whole time, you know. So, you know, maybe they're falling through the, the, the net. Yeah, and it's difficult for apprentices as well to, to sometimes finish off their apprenticeship because... You know, Section 106 says you to bring the apprentices on, but sometimes they've only made it partially through their apprenticeship uh, b before the programme finishes and then they're chucked off and they have to go on the conveyor belt again. Um, so they, they have their own difficulties in getting their apprenticeship finished as well. Yeah. Hi, Gordon. Sorry, do you have any, <clears throat> any maybe question for Mark? It's just because we do really need to wrap up. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Mark, for missing your talk earlier. So, yeah. Yeah. No, no, sorry there. It was just, um, uh, just that last topic there. Sorry, Mark, we, we, I, I had a couple of things written down for you, right? And, Thank God. Like, but no, it was, <laughs> and I tell you why, purely, <laughs> it was purely because well, one of your images you showed linked into a few discussions that we had were on our Triversity project there when the students fired the head and they were doing structure MEP and, and uh, architecture and had their floor to floor heights. And it kind of, kind of looked like everybody, quite a few of them had taken the default four meters floor to floor height. And um, then we got talking to them, you know, about the, the heights to be looking at. And it, you had an image up there of the refurb on the brew house. And it looked like quite a low floor uh, under beam height. Uh, so how did you deal with, what, am I correct in that? And how did you deal with the services? Uh, you are correct. And we had to run them in the raised access for uh, above and below to get the services into that. So in that particular room, you have uh, from finished floor to underside of beam about 2.2 metres. Then the beams are about six, 700 deep. So in the desking areas, it's not too low. But in terms of getting services, we couldn't cross any services underneath those beams. You know, very, very tricky. I mean, in that building, uh, you know, there, there wasn't a single level floor. It was all over the place trying to get it to work. And actually, we used raised access floors a lot to try and deal with that. But the biggest problem we had in that photograph you're talking about with the beams was services and floor ceiling heights. Right. Yeah. I have to say, I, I it's great to see that adaptive reuse. Uh, and I was, I was kind of surprised that the, the, the savings that you reckon in comparison to demolition and rebuild? It's half the cost, yeah, for, for sure. <coughs> uh, at least the efficiency. Never mind the fact that you probably would have a 12-month delay trying to figure out the archaeology on that site. Yes. And all other various things you'd find, bad, bad ground, etc. Um, we were shocked as well. I mean, when the demolition was finished, you know, people were saying, why don't you knock the whole thing down? Yeah. Uh, but uh, there was a lot of really good building fabric left to be used. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting down in and around there um, and uh, the library when, it, when it's completed. Uh, so will the public be able to access the river through, you know, the, 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 the beautiful images you had there down beside uh, Mayfair and the Brew House and uh, right down the river? Yeah, that's all a public park. Pardon? At what point will the river walk be opened up? Um, the end of this year. The linear park should be complete. Okay. And open to the public. Great. And then that's projected to be, is it sort of cafes and bars down there, is it? 
in, in, in due course, yeah. But I mean, there would be no buildings down there probably for another five years. Okay. Uh, so the brew has to be finished in the middle of this year. Um, phase two, the brew house will probably start. The, the design will start in a few months. I'm sure it's out to tender for design teams at the moment. And then probably the next building will be the hotel on the southeast of the site, close to the river. Okay. Uh, mm. That's already good. Look, thanks, Mark. The, um, no problem. I just see no other questions there, right? But I want to put a question out there because it was uh, Grenfell was touched on, right? And anybody can answer this, right? But uh, it might end up being Archie. But anyway, just when he brought Grenfell up there, and I seen in the news uh, this week that Kingspan have removed its fire cert rating for its K15 board. So, did anybody else pick that up in the news this week? No. No? Archie? Yeah, I mean, there's been questions about uh, about about some of the testing that that has gone on in the in the uh, accredited test labs, and and um, it's kind of like who polices the police. So the test labs were always seen as the um, you know the the, the the one the one organisation you could trust. But when you spoke to people who had actually been at tests, they did mention that there were certain rigs that performed better than others. Or you you were you were allowed into the lab to make adjustments and you could move thermocouples, um, so, so that was kind of known in the industry. But one of the issues was that when a lot of the tests were replicated uh, two years ago, uh, most of the systems failed, even Rockwell-based systems. But the, the the fundamental issue with cladding was that desktop uh, desktop assessments were permitted. So you had you had three routes to compliance within um, the, the Part B of the of the of the, of the building regulations in the UK, um, and one of those was that you get a full scale test. Now the full scale test had to be built exactly as it was in the rig, same fixing, same material. So if the outer material was fibre cement, which is fairly inert in Class A one. Uh, and the uh, and you replace that with an ACM. That's fundamentally different. The what the testing bodies had actually said is that if you change the color of the outside facing, that in itself constitutes uh, a change. But it wasn't understood by the industry. I think one of the issues um, and and specifiers and designers would probably know this know this better. Like Gordon and Mark would probably know this that. Um, it, it, the, 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 the interpretation of, of fire safety in the regulations was very ambiguous and vague. And, and so the difference between spread of flame and contribution to fire, the use of UK regs versus um, uh, European test standards, it, it wasn't really well understood. And fire engineers were often reluctant to get involved in, in specification and in, in, uh, in, in, in items like that. So it's, I mean, what it points to is that the, the problems that happened in, uh, in Grenfell were, were a bit like the, the, is it the Challenger spacecraft, that it, 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 was, it was a systematic failure across the entire um, industry. And it was this idea of the, the holes in the Swiss cheese all lining up, you know, that it wasn't just one issue, it was a combination like any of those issues on their own wouldn't have been problematic, but it was a combination of eight or nine different simple steps that weren't taken or checks that weren't done or decisions that maybe uh, weren't taken that that collectively led to a catastrophic failure. You know, so, so, so I don't know, is there any other view on that from the, the architects in the room? No, I couldn't comment on this, really. You mark? Dangerous to comment on. Yeah. 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 But, um, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, the things I, I got in front from, from looking at that stuff was, was the change in the specifications, etc. And, um, you know, the issues around that. 
But that was an interesting article there uh, about that accreditation changing, that, that set accreditation changing, you know. So um, uh, I think they only done it on, or oh, anyway, start of the week there. So I don't know where that leaves us. Does that mean that buildings that relied on that certification in their cladding systems will have a retrospective problem with compliance? Well, what I, what I read there was when it was tested in 2005, then when it went into market in 20, 2006, the recipe had changed. Right. And that's where they, and that's where it's been withdrawn. It. And it was only because it was, it was linked in with the, um, the Grenville Tribunal, I think it came up there at some uh, discussion at Grenville uh, this week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I mean, all that um, has all got implications. Um, but just just linking back to, to what we were talking about, Archie, in uh, Grenville and all what happened there. Again, you, you've got what Bill was talking about. Um, that you know anybody that worked on that project and all these little systematic issues. I mean, you know, it's always in our industry. What can come back and catch you later on, a number of years later? It, it, it doesn't, you know, once you finish a project, it doesn't always necessarily uh, sit there in the past. No, they don't. They don't end. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Any any final comments there? Uh, I see Bill's got to go, and yeah. so, I, so thanks, Bill. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you, Mark thanks, and yeah. Archie and Gordon. Bill. Thanks, Mark and Archie. Thanks, Archie and Mark. Great. It was it was a great first day, Gordon. Well done. <laughs> well, thank you, guys. It was, it's always good to get talking with with, with everybody. You know. No, it was great. Yeah. It's going to be recorded, so it'll be going up onto the CTU.